I just want to thank Evelyn for inviting me again. Um, I was here three years ago and it was fantastic. And um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, as you will see in this lecture, I do find it uh, inspiring every time I come here, particularly in relation to theatre architecture, which I love very much. And um, it's, it's a very wordy philosophical paper, I'm afraid, with not lots of juicy images. Um, even though I, I'm known for having many, many images, but I'm just going to have um, a lot of words, um, uh, sorry, that I thought could reinforce. Given more time, I would have also put it up in um, Brazilian. But let's get started, because we're going to talk about Nietzsche's architecture, and so I'm starting off with a very fine piece of architecture, Nietzsche's moustache. <laughs> Uh, this presentation revolves around uh, the influential part played by the late 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche in rethinking the potential of theatre architecture as action rather than object. Although he was not always explicit in his references to the built environment, Nietzsche's writing does reveal radical spatial thinking, especially in relation to performance space and spatial performativity. Beginning with his bitter disappointment in Wagner's Bayreuth Festspielhaus, the paper unpacks a series of Nietzsche's enduring discursive ideas, present, presenting his architectural thought as a shifting, open-ended project in itself, which is as relevant today as it was 150 years ago. By acknowledging the event as a means of challenging architecture's status as fixed and enduring object, he contributed to rethinking the built environment as an orchestrated set of systems, forces, and complex socio-political and embodied relationships and experiences more in a state of active becoming than passive being. Being an event rather than an object, performance is radically unstable in the meanings it generates and in, its acti in the activities it engages. The tendency of 20th century art is to revolve around the act rather than the work, because the act is the intense power of beginning can only be thought in the present. These two statements, made by the theatre theorist Gay Macaulay and philosopher Alain Badiou in the early 21st century signal the eventual turn, begun by the historical avant-garde as active and eruptive of the old, which signaled a break with architectural history in which past epochs had expressed their will to form. Through last century's spatio-temporal revolutions in science, arts and communication, Architecture can now be understood as an intimate system of forces giving shape and rhythm to everyday life, shifting from the static spatialization of time as an object to the more dynamic temporalization of space as action, emphasizing movement, relativity, and duration. This realignment of architecture from passive being to active becoming foreground spatial performativity, which is most dynamic in theatre itself. Where fictive and real spatial temporalities variably intersect and alternate. Theatre conventionally refers to both dramatic practice, the event, and the building space. So that's event and space housing that practice. As an art form, it incorporates the theatrical artifice of fleeting events that utilize the ephemeral elements of gesture, light, and sound, alongside the disposable materials of costume, prop, and setting. While as built form, it provides a seemingly stable environment conceived to persist beyond the transitory performances it houses. As event space, a term attributed to contemporary architect Bernard Schumi, in which architecture could not be dissociated from the events that happened in it, theatre harnesses spacing as architectural performativity, described by Jacques Derrida as a means of taking place through the event, an architectural acting out that puts something into form. Navigating between the space of architecture and architectural space, 
spacing is an architectural act for both the designer formulating architecture and the inhabitant experiencing it. As the provocation of an event, it constitutes an act always in the making, whereby inhabitants are constantly reconstructing their perception of an engagement with the built environment through embodied occupation. Despite innovative rethinking of theatre architecture over the last century, finally overthrowing the 300-year-old Baroque archetype with multiple experimental and hybrid forms in new and adapted buildings, the persistent form of a rationally planned auditorium in which parallel low rows of seats face a framed and separated stage house tends to dominate a globalized imaginary alongside the ubiquitous black box studio that replaces the stage itself as a spatial void within which theatrical images are technologically manufactured. This cookie cutter archetype found in performing art centers worldwide enacts a disciplinary spacing and is the direct legacy of Wagner's theater, the Fischspielhaus, a coherent anti-Italianate model that opened in 1876 and was eventually embraced by architecture's modern movement as rational and democratic. Yet, as David Weil suggests, theater architecture turned out to be one of modernism's greatest failures. Flexible, versatile theatres stripped of social messages, proving a conceptual impossibility. The machine à jouer proved as chimeric as Le Corbusier's machine à vivre. Generally recognised as the philosopher of the avant-garde and original postmodern thinker, Nietzsche fiercely opposed the abiding model of the highly decorated, multi-layered auditorium with its framed technological stage, which the 19th century European bourgeoisie had appropriated for performing their newfound post-revolutionary status. He was initially influenced by Wagner, to whom he dedicated his first book, The Birth of Tragedy. Having spent time with the composer during the conception and planning of the Bayreuth Fischbühlhaus while exiled in Switzerland, in, the birth of tra uh, in fact, The Birth of Tragedy was published the same year construction began on the building in which Nietzsche held so much hope for a new kind of performance space as both art and architecture. However, by the time the building opened, the young philosopher had lost faith in his mentor. Nietzsche was bitterly disappointed with the Fischfield House, which negated visceral public engagement that was so critical to his participatory formulation. As a disciplinary mechanism, the Fischbühlhaus's architecture reinforced rather than effaced the frame distance. Despite the maestro's initially radical intention to subvert architectural monumentality by establishing a temporary structure, the Fischbühlhaus's rigid form failed to fulfill his acolyte's demand for an undermining of enduring structures in favor of a new spatial performativity which recognizes unstable terrain, advocates the real of the representational, and integrates performers and audience in a choric ground designed to, uni to, designed to unite them. Although little has been written on the architectural thinking of Nietzsche, who was not always explicit in his references to the built environment, this presentation probes his writing in order to reveal just how radical his spatial thinking was. Beginning with his bitter disappointment in Wagner's Fischbühlhaus, it goes on to unpack a series of Nietzsche's enduring discursive ideas. First, in relation to demonumentalizing theatre architecture in favour of choric space <coughs> that eliminates the boundary between performers and spectators. Um, and second, in his recognition of a new post-revolutionary anti-scenic paradigm emerging from the death of God. And third, in his undermining that while the artist resists the status quo, his understanding, the architect reinforces society's power structures. Nietzsche's interrogation of how performance space itself performs in and as an event is haunted by Wagner, whose enduring architectural project was variably a source of inspiration, 
disenchantment and frustration in relation to building thought. Um, if we desired and dared an architecture corresponding to the nature of our soul, says Nietzsche, we are cowardly for it, our model would have to be the labyrinth. In his essay, Why Peter Eisenman Writes Such Good Books, Jacques Derrida asks, what might be a Wagnerian architecture? Referencing Nietzsche's own title, Why I Write Such Good Books, from Echo Homo, Derrida exposes the central query and that of this chapter, of this paper, to be, what might a Nietzschean architecture be for the artwork is both event and space, which the philosopher had hoped Wagner would fulfill. This, of course, is a challenging task, as Nietzsche really wrote directly about architecture and his philosophies have been appropriated and interpreted to shape both conservative and radical agendas in all aspects of art and politics. However, the role of spatialization of his thinking serves to undermine the proper place of both art and politics, the proper place of both architecture and architect, architect and architecture, just as his writings on tragedy aim to destabilize theatre as bourgeoisie entertainment. As Nadir Lahiji points out in the missed encounter of radical philosophy with architecture, Nietzsche inspired a new form of architectural thinking about the notion of building thought. But the philosopher's simultaneous ungrounding of thought influenced the ensuing theatrical avant-garde that went on to test alternative sites for housing the event as an event. As Lahiji writes, Nietzsche, the artist philosopher, regarded himself as a kind of architect of the imagination and wanted to see the edifice of his own thought as the mind that builds. He wanted his art of thinking to be synonymous with an art of building in which the verbal noun building would be fu a fundamental human activity in creating form. In 1994, the Getty Institute broached the question of Nietzschean architecture in a conference held in Weimar with a subsequent publication five years later entitled Nietzsche and Architecture of Our Minds, referring to his suggestion that the labyrinth provides a fitting architectural prototype to match the modernist soul. However, as Gary Shapiro notes in a review of the anthology, none of the contributors address Nietzsche's writing on the Greek theatre in The Birth of Tragedy, which is probably his most extended treatment of an architectural work. Such an undertaking discloses the philosopher's spatial speech as one that reconciled distanced Apollonian aesthetics with immersive Dionysian frenzy. While the boundaries between the real and imagined architecture of Nietzsche's philosophies create an evasive territory, nowhere is this more slippery a spatiality and more relevant than in the theatre, which is predicated on the co-presence of real and imagined spaces. Nietzsche's writing also reveal a distance between radical propositions for possible architectures and the architectural profession's complicity in the powers that prevent their realization. Nietzsche wrote, for an event to possess greatness, two things must come together, greatness of spirit and those who accomplish it, and greatness of spirit of those who experience it. He eagerly attended the foundation laying ceremony for the Feshbiel House in 1872, which inspired him to write his meditation on Richard Wagner and Bayreuth, recognizing the building as an encapsulation of the composer's artwork where performance is event and place is space come together in a new form with a new audience, constituting a significant turning point that combined creative accomplishment and enhanced public experience. His desire for a more participatory and performative theater can be formulated as event space in which the built environment housing the event is itself an event and an integral driver of experience. The building opened in 1876, a year after Charles Garnier's Paris Opera opened, a Beaux-Arts masterpiece that represented the conclusion of an epoch in which the audience's spectacle melded with the spectacularly ornate 
multi-leveled architecture. Seeking to remove such distraction and focus on the emphatically framed stage event, Wagner abandoned Gottfried Semper, his architect, who had already created plans for both a temporary and permanent theatre in Munich. Instead, working with Otto Bruchwald and technician Karl Brandt, who were willing to fulfill the impresario's desire to eliminate architectural detail and monumentality in order to subdue spatial and public expression. While the Parlay Garnier dedicated an extraordinary amount of floor space to lobbies, promenades, and the grand staircase with its multi-leveled cage of loges and balconies, Wagner all but eradicated the front of house in an effort to foreclose on audience sociality and emphasize his Gesamtkunstwerk, as you know, that means total work of art, in which architecture played a critical role through spectatorial control. This was most evident in the auditorium itself, where an austere interior with its steeply raked fan-shaped format focused viewers on the stage, requiring them to sit in darkness and in awed silence for hours at a time. And of course, we all know this was the first time the theatre was plunged into darkness, but apparently Wagner says it was a mistake. He meant to dim the lights, but he turned them out. That's what he says. Um, so, sorry, I'll just go back. The uprights of an emphatic proscenium frame were repeated into the auditorium, enclosing the audience within the perspectival setting of, of both... Of both architecture and scenery that convey that converged on a mutually sighted vanishing point toward the back of the stage. The buried orchestra pit reinforced the spatial unification of the real with the ideal by eliminating the customary visual and spatial interruption of musicians and conductor. Yet while the devices of double proscenium, invisible orchestra and darkness work to immerse the audience in the fictional world presented on the stage, they withheld any active participatory engagement with and between the audience which Nietzsche advocated. Nietzsche's experience of the new theatre, which he held so much hope in, during its inaugural Ring Cycle Festival in 1876, left him disenchanted. My mistake was to come to Bayreuth with an ideal. I was forced to experience the bitterest disappointment, the excessive ugliness, distortion and overexcitement repulsed me vehemently. In his letter outlining the case of Wagner in 19, 1888, the philosopher contends that the composer had created an art that <coughs> offers us a magnifying glass where everything looks big, even Wagner. <laughs> this magnification uh, effect equates with Wagner's double proscenium, which played with scale to make the performers on the fourth stage appear as gods. The visionary apparatus of his festival and its venue focused and concentrated effects with what Nietzsche calls the pressure of a hundred atmospheres. The interesting thing here, I think, is that it's cinematic, and people have said that it really was the first cinematic theatre. In removing the surrounding balconies and multiple viewpoints, and by tilting all audience members directly towards the stage, doubly framed by proscenium and doubly distanced by pit, Wagner had eradicated the last vestiges of audience as social performers. His emphasis on the illusory distance of the constructed scene and the immobility of the audience destroyed the choric realm advocated by Nietzsche in The Birth of Tragedy, while exemplifying the pure Apollonian vision which the philosopher spurned. And it's interesting to note, he really didn't spurn it, but he um, offered uh, the Dionysian as a kind of a counterpoint. Um, so he spurned it as a way of, of being able to destabilize it. Event space emerged as a contemporary paradigm from traumatic events and perceptual shifts occurring early last century that undermined both the theatrical conventions and material walls of the dramatic realistic theater. The well-constructed playhouse seemed as meaningless as the well-made bourgeois play. Even as architects' modern movement sought to industrialize, control, and harmonize space, theater's avant-garde wished to radically undermine it, celebrating the sacrificial body dancing amid the debris. This theatrical will to destruction, standing in opposition to an architectural will to creation, was prefigured by Nietzsche in The Birth of Tragedy, 
as modernism's first dramatic manifesto, which called for a return to the feverish Dionysian, the feverish excesses of Dionysian rites and ancient Greek performance, enacted before a more refined Apollonian approach was adopted that distanced the spectator. Sorry? Your, uh, your paper is pressing the button of the keyboard. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I think I'm all right. Okay, thank you for saying no. <laughs> um, so, um, right, the Dionysian performer is pure primordial pain and its primordial re-echoing is absorbed in the image, returning the precedence of the choros in the dancing place as a participatory space in which the image was unable to be apprehended as a whole. This return to an emphasis on the choric realm was intended to challenge the, prim the primacy of vision and efface the distance between the distanced view of the theatron and the exclusive performance realm of the Skene. Nietzsche desired to undermine the monumental forms of bourgeois theatre by introducing what Una Chowdhury calls a rule of disorder. His primary intention was to articulate and incorporate the opposing forces of Apollo as the god of healing and the arts and Dionysus, god of fertility, ritual, madness and wine, indicating the representational form and non-representational excess dynamically at play within the Attic tragedies of the Dionysian festivals as a model for regenerating art. The Apollonian principle of dreams, appearance and representation embodied in the distance contemplation from the theatron collided with the Dionysian principle of experience, intoxication and the will found in the participatory ritual within the choros. As fundamentally conflicting principles, their antecedents lay in Schopenhauer's contrast between the world as will and the world as representation. However, as Adrian Poole notes, Nietzsche's notion of the will was no longer the root of all evil, pain and suffering, but an inevitable consequence of the life force. For Schopenhauer, pain meant death throes. For Nietzsche, pain meant birth pangs. This complicated relationship between dying and birthing has spatial ramifications for the stage as Koros, which Nietzsche referred to as the womb, that gives, the womb that gives birth to drama, a primal ground melding dream into communal being by presenting itself to our eyes in what he called continual rebirths. Nietzsche wished creative and destructive forces to operate in dynamic tension, Working with binary oppositions is essential to the tragic form. He encourages us to accept and embrace contradictions rather than dialectically subverting them, thereby revealing the essential nature of violence, pain and conflict and the need to acknowledge and incorporate them into the artwork. Tragedy was an admonition and critique against the rigid Apollonian form which the Dionysian Act came to shatter revealing the inherent fragility of human structures as individual identities, social institutions, and constructed assemblages. Dionysus as creator and destroyer is a force, give, force driving through all forms, challenging their Apollonian individuation, differentiation, and rigidity, making and remaking them. This radical critique of the human products, structures and artifacts in which we put so much faith impacted as much on architecture as other forms, particularly on the auditorium. Nietzsche deliberately cr critiqued the Apollonian architectonics of Doric form that denied the natural instincts and savage excesses of the Dionysian festival, which he referred to as that horrible mixture of sensuality and cruelty. Through the performance of the Dionysian dithyram, the visceral and ecstatic dancing body undermined architectonic control, causing a astonishment in the Apollonian Greek, mingled with the shuddering suspicion that all this was not so very alien to him after all. In fact, that it was the only Apollonian consciousness which like a veil hid Dionysian world from his vision. 
The communal shudder that trespasses on consciousness is a visceral experience, underscoring how the Dionysian exceeds vision just as the dance exceeds place. The ecstatic sensorium of the performing body displaces the more static oculocentrism of architecture, undermining its stability with Zarathustra's dancing mad feet. As Mark Wigley contends of Nietzsche's dance, it disrupts the spatial regime by, by locating something aspatial within it. Containing a phas phantasmagoric promise of, of theatre's virtuality, it troubles architecture's secure spatiality. The inherent excesses of performance exposed by Nietzsche in laughter and play, as well as in dance, mobilized things as multiple and eventual and weakened the basis upon which thought itself had previously been constructed. In the architecture of deconstruction, Wigley names this philosophical instability the edifice complex, where metaphysics as a sound structure erected on secure foundations and stable ground is threatened because the ground is no longer considered stable. Um, Nietzsche created a new philosophical space seen by Heidegger as ungrounding ground, opening up and revealing the metaphysical void. In aligning philosophy with architecture, we can see that Nietzsche's thought destabilized bill form by weakening its structures and questioning its abiding qualities of strength and durability. Um, I'll just skip a little bit here. Let me just see. Um, for Nietzsche, the true tragedy of modernity was a refusal to communally embrace a primordial unity in the face of the loss of God and Christianity's homogeneous unity. Acknowledging the life-giving chaos as the basis of the universe. As an apolonial force, the increasingly utopian project of modern architecture denied this tragic Dionysian vision, while it attempted to build a rational, unified world over the void, rather than looking boldly right into the terrible destructiveness of so-called world history, as well as the cruelty of nature. An anarchic prophet of modernism, Nietzsche's spatial speech continues to undermine conventional theatre architecture revealing the modernist tragedy as doubt in the divine, loss of a center, confrontation of the...